Yo friend, this is the Sigma 100 to 400. And I just brought it with me up into the Canadian wilderness to an area that's twice the size of Yellowstone. And filmed a bunch of really nice shots with it. And I think it punches above its weight class. Let's talk about this lens for video. So the 100 to 400 from Sigma. This is a really lovely lens. Uh, right out of the gate from me, this would get a, a wood buy again. I think my overall rating for this lens is about a 7.2, 7.5. Uh, for the value that you put into it, it packs quite a heavy punch. And the closest comparison I can think of is 100 to 400 from Sony themselves. It can get you nice and tight for some, some really delightful shots. So when you're doing wildlife stuff, you can get close to your animals. When you're doing extreme sports, you can get tight in shots on whatever the action is. When you're filming fishing, like I was in this instance, you can get nice and close shots and get some beautiful compression. So when you back way up from your subject, the optical trick allows you to make the background look way more impressive in line with your subject. And that's what I've missed moving over to the full frame system in my kit is that super telephoto range. On crop sensor cameras, on micro four thirds cameras, I always had really zoomed in lenses. But when you move up to the larger sensor sizes, getting those super telephoto lenses just means they're so much bigger. And this lens I think is a really nice balance. It's about the size of a Nalgene water bottle. Uh, it's not F4, it's F5 to 6.3. That currently is its biggest downside in my opinion. I often shot with this lens just at 6.3. And the reason for that is as I zoom in, I don't want my exposure changing. So I wanna be able to quickly grab shots at different points in the range and I don't want the image changing exposure so I don't have to fiddle with the dials. I'm often dialing in my exposure with a variable ND filter on the front. All the shots you're seeing are with the Polar Pro variable NDs. They're currently my favorite. Their color cast is the most consistent. It's present just like any variable ND filter, but it's the most consistent. So I run that on all my lenses. So when I'm filming, everything just color grades together nicely. All around the build quality of this lens, I'd equate pretty similar to the 24 to 105 from Sony. Uh, it's fine, it's good enough. It's splash proof. Uh, with a lot of lenses, I go way beyond what they ask you to. I get them quite wet, quite destroyed. I haven't really abused this one too much yet, so we're, we're gonna have to revisit this in a year's time and see how it did with our, our winters here in uh, British Columbia. But it is splash proof and it has this rubber gasket on the end to help prevent dust and moisture from getting into the camera body. Let's address the stabilization. This was the area that I was hoping for better performance. I'd give it a six, 6.5 out of 10. It works. It's not gonna blow you away and save shots that you're ruining otherwise. So handheld with this lens, it is one of those situations where shooting in 60 frames and slowing it down is probably gonna be what you need to do. Shooting handheld with this at the deeper end, it, uh, it, it moves. <laughs> Especially if you're trying to track a subject, I struggled to get that nailed down. Here's a handheld shot at 100 millimeters, just trying to hold the camera decently steady. Here's a shot at 100 with stabilization off. Here's a shot at 400 millimeters, trying to hold the camera again, just as steady. Here's a shot at 400 with stabilization off. Here's a shot at 100 with some movement, stabilization on. Here's a shot at 200 with some movement. Here's a shot at 400 with some movement. Stabilization on. And this is one of those things where on an adventure shoot, I'm not always gonna bring a massive pan tilt fluid head. I did for the first time test out this small rig, tiny fluid head. This thing's about 120 bucks and it does an all right job. It does better than a ball head, let's say that. And it lets you kind of track around and follow things. So I chucked this lens onto this tiny ball, onto this tiny fluid head, and managed to try get some shots tracking planes as they were taking off or landing. 
and uh, they're not amazing. Uh, the stabilization was just struggling in the different modes of trying to track with that subject, and I was having a hard time pulsing and keeping up with it. If I added the collar and mounted from the collar, that might have gotten me slightly better performance. That is a downside of this lens that it doesn't come with a collar. It's kind of annoying. I didn't know that, so I didn't buy one for the trip. I probably should have had one because I think I could have gotten better panning performance with this setup. However, some of these shots, if you throw a stabilization pass on them and select the moments that you want to use out of it, it cleans up all right. It's, it's usable even. So that same headspace I take over into using it handheld. If you're careful, if you hold your camera nice and steady, tight against your body, use good filming technique, you can get moments, even moments that will play back in real time. But it doesn't take long for you to move just the wrong way and to throw the image and do one of those stutter adjustments where the lens is just trying to keep up. So it's not magic. It's not what I'm used to with the GH5 system and, and the 100 to 350. It's not doing what that lens can do. It gets rid of micro jitters. It can do a good job on a good fluid head, but it's not gonna be a complete magic trick. You still have to put some work in to get good shots. So I've done a whole other video talking through my philosophy and some of the lens choices I've already made for adventure filmmaking and how I've tried to keep things light already. But some of my opinions have been changing and updating, especially as new lenses have been getting released. So especially the 35 to 150 from Tamron that was just released, there's some exciting new lenses. So I've got an updated gear list that I'll keep adding to that you can just find in the description down below that I'll kind of talk through kind of my latest Sony lens setup decisions for video because this world's always changing there's always new things coming out so i want to keep that as up to date as possible so if my opinions have expanded or developed since this video that's the best place to find kind of my most recent up-to-date thoughts on best lenses i want to take a moment to tell you about something else that i definitely think you should add to your production adventure toolkit and this thing has one really awesome feature that i think every portable power bank definitely definitely needs to have uh, and this is the Powerhouse 555. It just came out from Anchor. This battery bank packs a lot of punch. And my absolute favorite feature of it is that it's got a USB-C input and output port. This is incredible. I don't know why I didn't think of this. I think every power bank in existence needs to have this. But the form factor of this guy and the fact that you can charge it with just any laptop, iPad, whatever charger, you can get power into this thing to keep using on top of solar, on top of all the other ways that you could normally charge it, that's fantastic because keeping track of cords while you're on an adventure can be a bit of a hassle. So that feature alone, <laughs> just the pleasure of use for that is quite exciting for me. I love the larger power banks. I put one of them in my dad's van. I put one of them in Jesse's van. And when Anchor came out with the larger powerhouse, I was really excited about that because it has so much capacity, so much oomph. But this size fitting in right nicely underneath that makes this one really quick to just grab and go. It still has over a thousand watt hours of capacity, which is great. It has a thousand watt inverter, which will basically do most of your household accessories. And the best part about these systems is that they're lithium iron phosphate. So those are the same cell chemistry that we use in our camper van here. And the reason why we went with those cells is because they are longer lasting. So having that same chemistry in a smaller form factor means it's gonna outlive all of those cheaper battery chemistries. And you're gonna be able to get a lot of use out of this thing for many years to come. This little guy is an awesome addition to Anchor's powerhouse lineup. I'm quite impressed with the form factor and all the features they packed in here. Check out the links in the description if you want to learn more about Anchor's battery banks. Thanks Anchor for keeping me charged and sponsoring this video. Something that's a big miss for this lens is that there's no teleconverters for it. Sigma has some for their L mount version, but not the Sony mount version. And for me, that's a bummer because if you could put a two times teleconverter or even 1.5 and get that even longer range, that would just make this such a workhorse for those super telephoto niche moments where you want to get even further zoomed into your subject matter. So it's a bummer to me and I'm hoping that the reason why they haven't done it is for some engineering, like logical reason and not just because they're lazy and just haven't done it. Just because if they're being lazy, they should definitely make one because I would buy it. Some alternatives I considered to getting this lens were, well, firstly, just not getting a super telephoto full frame lens, just running an APS-C crop sensor body and one of those micro super telephoto lenses like the 18 to 300 or whatever ridiculous small compact lenses. For me, those get the same coverage and uh, just adaptability of having another smaller camera body. 
Uh, the problem is, is that Sony doesn't have a professional level crop sensor camera right now. They have some options there, but the Jello, it's just, they don't have enough offerings crop sensor. I think they should. Sony, please make better crop sensor cameras because I think the lens selection on crop sensor is more valuable in a lot of scenarios for the types of things, whatever. So I went full frame because the A7S III, the larger full frame sensor lineups from Sony are currently their better offerings for portable small cameras. I digress, but other things in the full frame world that I considered was getting their 70 to 200 2.8 and doing a teleconverter on that. That is still something that if money was no object, I might consider over this. The reason for that is 70 to 200 2.8. It's an amazing lens. That's just such an incredible lens. The sharpness from that lens, the new version of it is also incredible. That's probably what I would have tried to do with either a 1.5 or whatever the other teleconverter from Sony, whatever that is, I would have considered that. The 100 to 400 from Sony is also really good. It's better than this. Uh, the price is just more than double. So that's some other things that I considered and ultimately it ended up coming down to price. And uh, so far I don't feel the compromise has been that bad. I think it's been all right. I think it's been uh, pretty good even. So that's some of the other things I considered. Uh, I'm mainly gonna use this for scenarios where I know I'm filming other subject matter. And for that job, for this price point, for this size, this is, a, this is a win. This is an easy 7.3 out of 10. Let's, let's just call it that. 7.3 out of 10, that's what this lens is to me. I'm quite delighted by it. The price point's awesome. That's it for this one. Thanks so much for watching, and remember, life's better when you make stuff. Peace.